group level epistemic cognitions within a knowledge community and inquiry curriculum for secondary science. Uh, my name is Elisa Acosta, and I'm here with my colleagues, Michelle Louis, and uh, my supervisor, Jim Slava. So first, uh, I'll provide a bit of background on the project and an overview of some of the key theoretical concepts. So first of all, uh, we have a model, a formal model of learning called knowledge community inquiry. So the idea of knowledge communities is um, one that has been researched for some time. Uh, so two well-researched examples include uh, fostering communities of learners by Brown, Brown and Campion and knowledge building by Scardamilia and the writer. Um, epistemologically, the knowledge community approach represents a key shift away from the notion of self as learner, who's potentially in competition with his or her peers, to one where students work together collaboratively and share collective responsibility for knowledge advancement within the community. Um, the knowledge community and inquiry model contains several key components. Um, there's a community knowledge base, which serves as a resource uh, for the knowledge community. Um, students work together um, to construct knowledge collaboratively um, by performing scaffolded inquiry activities with accessible learning outcomes. Um, KCI includes with it a set of uh, five design principles which guide the creation of uh, curriculum designs under the KCI model. And within each design principle, um, each one is accompanied by a set of epistemological commitments, pedagogical affordances, as well as technology elements. So I am focusing here on the epistemological commitments of the KCI model. Um, so these include things such as students identifying as a knowledge community um, with a shared purpose of learning together, um, performing knowledge building processes in order to facilitate knowledge growth, um, the inquiry is fundamentally constructivist, and there's a social dimension of shared ideas. Um, there's an emphasis on idea growth as well. Um, the role of the teacher is that of an expert collaborator or mentor who's very much involved in the inquiry process and serves as a service and orchestrational role uh, throughout. The second ingredient that went into this project is a framework for epistemic cognition. And this was um, Chin, uh, Clark Chin and his colleagues um, developed an expanded framework for epistemic cognition in a 2011 paper. And this included five key dimensions. So epistemic aims and epistemic value, structure of knowledge and other epistemic achievements, sources of knowledge, justification, and related epistemic stances, epistemic virtues and vices, as well as reliable and unreliable processes for achieving epistemic aims. Now, in his paper, um, he maintains a focus on individual cognitions within each of these five dimensions, um, but suggests that there's an area of opportunity for future research um, to explore these five dimensions at the level of groups or social analysis, which is um, what we're doing here in the context of a knowledge community. So I recognize that this is kind of difficult to read, um, but the point here is that uh, the first step was to take the five epistemic commitments of the KCI model. And then these were filtered using the five dimensions of Chin's framework. So each of the five uh, epistemic commitments of KCI were coded according to the five dimensions um, to produce this set of five uh, epistemic commitments. And the focus of uh, the current paper um, that I'm presenting today is on one of these dimensions. So the sources of knowledge, justification of knowledge, and epistemic stance. The third component of this project is the design. Um, so until the present study, um, the epistemic elements of KCI have not been firmly tested or evaluated. So in order to adequately assess students' epi epistemic cognitions within the context of a knowledge community for secondary science, um, an application of KCI was needed. So, this design is called Evo Room, and it was created and conceptualized by my colleague, Michelle Lee, who presented on it yesterday. And this is essentially a grade 11 biology curriculum design, um, which covers the units for evolution and biodiversity. And use of the term Evo Room actually has uh, two uses. 
So in one sense, it refers to an actual room, so a smart classroom environment where students uh, enter the room and they're immediately immersed in this uh, rainforest of Borneo, Sumatra. So each of the four walls depicts um, interactive species and um, displays where students make observations using the walls, using handheld tablet devices, um, and the observations that they make through their tablets are then accumulated on the front interactive whiteboards on this aggregate display. And you can see in the diagram there are pieces of evidence that are um, observations that are being added in real time as students undergo this activity. The second use of the word Evo room is actually in reference to the broader uh, curriculum timeline. So this is a curriculum that took place over the course of 16 weeks. And it included two activities uh, within the smart classroom, but it also included activities in a variety of other contexts, such as the student's regular classroom, um, interspersed with regular traditional lecture and lab sessions. Um, there was also a homework component, which was done using an online learning portfolio, so another persistent uh, resource that was available to the students. And there was also a field trip component to this as well. Um, the pilot study for this was completed in June 2011, and since then there have been two design iterations. So this uh, present paper is um, in reference to the most recent design iteration, which took place um, between March and May of 2013. Um, the paper here has two uh, research questions. So number one, how does the design of collaborative inquiry activities affect the ways in which knowledge is justified and shared within the knowledge community? And secondly, how are students' epistemic stances influenced by the nature of the collective inquiry design? So just to clarify, an epistemic stance refers to the position one takes um, with respect to a knowledge claim. So someone can be certain or uncertain, one can entertain an idea or use an idea as a working hypothesis, etc. Um, and I should also point out that although um, the KCI model served as an important reference for design decisions within the EVO room curriculum, um, none of the designs up to this point were explicitly concerned with epistemic cognition. So researchers were interested in things such as designing activity sequences um, to engage students in the relevant biology content and um, understanding the interactions that occur within the immersive environment. So this research study is kind of taking an epistemological pass at this already existing design. So our participants for this study consisted of a co-design team, which had three researchers, three programmers, and a regular classroom teacher. And this co-design team met um, at regular intervals uh, throughout the design iteration. And additionally, the student participants consisted of two sections of grade 11 biology. And again, this was for the evolution and biodiversity units of the course. Data sources for this study um, came from a variety of sources. So there was a pre-post survey that was administered before and after the entire 16-week Evo Room curriculum. There was also another survey that was administered before and after the zoo field trip, so one day. Um, there were digital learning artifacts contributed through um, the online learning portfolio, as well as the mobile app Zydeco, which I'll describe in a minute, as well as researcher observations and field notes. Now for this paper, um, two of the activities are going to be focused upon, uh, the zoo field trip and the biodiversity spent classroom activity. And the reason for this is because each of those two activities use the same uh, mobile app, Dynaco, uh, which was developed by Chris Santana and his team at the University of Michigan. Um, so students were using the same technology platform and the same scaffolds to record those activities, but pedagogically um, they were different in terms of the structure and the, the use of the collaboration uh, throughout those two activities. So I'll first begin by describing the Zoo field trip. So students were given, um, students were assigned to teams of four, and each team was given one or two uh, iPads or iPod touches. And each group was assigned to a specific geographical region of the zoo and a specific species group within that geographic region. And their task was to go through the zoo 
and they could collect evidence using a variety of multimodal notes. So they could have photos, text notes, audio notes, video notes. And each of those notes was in reference to one of three overarching questions. So um, the unity of biodiversity, human impacts on biodiversity, and the effectiveness of educational exhibits. So as students went around the zoo, they would take photos and they could supplement their photos with uh, text notes and tags, and they could also attach their um, notes to a particular uh, guiding question. And as students collected these pieces of evidence or their observations, um, this data was all synced to a shared evidence base. So everyone who participated in the zoo field trip, or everyone in the class rather, had access to everybody else's observations. When students returned from the zoo field trip, they were assigned to the task of creating uh, a claim statement, or three claim statements, in response to the three guiding questions that um, they had throughout their zoo field trip. Um, so although the evidence is collected in groups and the shared evidence base was reflected the contributions of everyone in the knowledge community, these claim statements were completed individually. And the structure was guided by the Zydeco scaffold, so it was a claim evidence reasoning structure. So students provided a claim statement to explain one of the unifying principles of biodiversity. They chose evidence based on um, the, the shared evidence base, they used evidence to support their claim statement, and then in the reasoning portion, they had to explain how that evidence supported their claim statement. In the Biodiversity Smart Classroom activity, students again used the Zydeco app, except this time the task was um, they entered the Smart Classroom environment and each of the four walls or stations depicted a different climatic scenario. So for example, high temperature, low rainfall, earthquake, or low temperature. Now these text labels were not present on the walls when students walked in, so they didn't know uh, which was which. And their task was to collect evidence supporting um, which climatic scenario uh, was assigned to them. So students had been given the assignment leading into the smart classroom activity to research how a particular climatic scenario would affect the Borneo Sumatra rainforest. And their task within the smart classroom was to decide which of these four walls represented their climatic scenario. So as students went through the activity, um, their evidence artifacts that they submitted through Zydeco were collected in real time on the front interactive whiteboard. Um, and then on the teacher's tablet, she had the uh, capability of filtering the notes using a particular climatic um, uh, tag that the students had assigned to the note. So here we see the teacher has enabled the tsunami tag, um, which filters all the notes that were um, tagged with tsunami. And it revealed that most of the notes about tsunami were collected at station D. Now, pedagogically speaking, um, I mentioned previously that there were several key differences between the zoo activity and the biodiversity activity. So first and foremost was the fact that the zoo claims were completed individually. So although they drew from the shared evidence base, um, the claim statements were ultimately completed on an individual basis. Whereas in the biodiversity activity, the claims were completed in groups. Uh, the second key difference was that um, claims were evaluated on the zoo field trip. So this activity was for marks and assessed by the teacher. Whereas in the biodiversity activity, it was not for marks. Um, and I should point out here that in Canada, we have, as part of our assessment policy, at least in Ontario, um, we're not allowed to evaluate or assign group marks for everything. You only are allowed to evaluate individuals within a group according to their contributions to the group. Um, so only the zoo activity claims were evaluated for marks. And the final key difference was that in the zoo activity, the responses were open-ended. So again, they were responding to broad key uh, concepts such as unifying principles of biodiversity, um, human impacts of biodiversity, etc. Whereas in the biodiversity activity, the responses were closed-ended. So there was a right and wrong answer as to which of the four boards depicted their climatic scenario. So some of the key findings, and again, I'm focusing just on the, the sources, justification, and epistemic stance dimension here. 
Um, so a survey was administered before and after enacting the Evil Room curriculum. Um, and this was an open-ended survey item that asked students to identify their sources of knowledge in school science. So students would just list sources of knowledge that they use throughout school science. So the pre-survey revealed a heavy reliance on authoritative sources of knowledge. So 89% of the responses um, really depended on authority. So things such as the textbook, the teacher, and external authoritative sources such as the internet or journals. Um, however, following uh, the enactment of the Evil Room activity, there was more of a balance between authority, peers, and the self as sources of knowledge. So um, peers included things like peer discussion, um, access to the shared knowledge base, uh, or use of the aggregate display. And the self included things such as primary observations, uh, prior learning or memory, as well as reasoning or logic. With respect to the justification of knowledge, um, there is an interesting observation that students in the zoo activity, again, completed individually, were very conscientious <coughs> about their choice of evidence artifacts in support of their claims statement. So students wanted to really perform well on this evaluation, so they were very careful about choosing which evidence um, they would use to support their claim. However, in the biodiversity activity, um, the use of evidence artifacts to support their claim statements was almost an afterthought. And here, um, students favored <coughs> consensus or agreeableness within the group over evidential justification. And so a lot of these negotiations um, came down to either a group vote or um, students just wanted to appease the other group members in their group. And interestingly, another finding was that the amount of evidence that students used to support their claim statement in the biodiversity activity was linked to their success in correctly identifying their climatic scenarios. <clears throat> so here in this bar graph we see there were four sessions that took place within the Evil Room Smart Classroom. And each session consisted of four groups of students. So in session C, 93% of the evidence artifacts that were collected by the students were used as supporting evidence in their claim statement. And session C was the only group in which all four uh, groups correctly identified the climatic scenario. In session A, 57% of the evidence artifacts that were collected were used as supporting evidence and claims. And here, only one of the four groups correctly identified the climatic scenario. In sessions B and sessions D, um, which used 38% and 29% respectively of their evidence artifacts, none of the groups were able to correctly identify the climatic scenario. So again, epistemic stance refers to the position one takes with respect to a knowledge claim. And here, it's important to note that when students are working in groups, it may be the case that um, students have an epistemic stance that may be in contrast or conflict with those of his or her collaborating peers. And what was observed um, oftentimes was that there was satisfying of uh, a student's true epistemic stance in order to appease group members, or to come to a consensus. So an example of this would be making a decision based on a group vote rather than on evidence. So to evaluate this, um, students were asked in a survey item whether they had reached consensus within their group as to which of the four walls depicted their climatic scenario. And this was cross-referenced with whether or not the group actually got their claim correct. So in cases where there was consensus in the group, and the claim statement was correct, this was coded as true certainty. In cases where there was consensus in the group and the claim statement was incorrect, this was coded as false certainty. And finally, in cases where there was no consensus in the group, so they couldn't come to an agreement, this was coded as uncertainty. So we can see here that in 57% of cases, <coughs> there was false, students were falsely certain that their claim was correct. All right, so with regards to sources of knowledge, we can see that engaging students in activities where they rely on the ideas of their peers, as well as their own observations, could result in a noticeable shift in the epistemic cognitions within this dimension. So students were relying less upon authoritative sources and more upon their peers and themselves, so there's a greater balance. With regards to justification of knowledge and epistemic stance, uh, 
Um, there were some weaknesses identified, which were turned into design priorities for future iterations of uh, this curriculum or future KCI curricula. So the first one is that the technology environment should somehow capture the knowledge negotiations amongst group members within the knowledge community. Um, so this would not only assist in preventing student satisficing, but would also provide a history of the idea growth within the knowledge community. Secondly, um, it's recommended that to support the justification of knowledge in a collaborative context, the question should be open-ended rather than closed-ended um, and should promote explanatory coherence over correctness. And finally, third, from a pedagogical perspective, um, students should understand the importance of justification in their reasoning and how um, satisfying their own epistemic stance would compromise the integrity of the inquiry activity. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. 